Can you imagine trying to describe sight to an unsighted person? I, I, I don't know what that would be like. Or, or perhaps, I don't even know how you would do this, trying to describe hearing to someone who cannot hear. Like, we're, we're talking about somebody who was born that way in both cases. Like, h- how would you try to communicate what it's like to someone who's never experienced it? Like, how would you explain a sunset to someone who's blind and, and not able to discern colors? Like, like, how would you do it? I mean, we would probably try, but I think it's something that's not really possible. I mean, it's not possible fully. What we would do is we would do the best we could, right? We would, we would try to describe these things as best we could with the language that we have. But, but for the person that can't see or can't hear, there's really no point of reference. It would be very, very difficult. And I think that's a little bit of the task that John has. He's trying to describe, using the language that he has and the point of references that he has, he's trying to describe something to us that is incomprehensible. Like in many ways, heaven, the eternity, all of it, it's like trying to describe sight to the blind. It's too much. I think we need to understand that it's too much to fully comprehend. And the reason why it's too much to fully comprehend is because it's too marvelous. Like that, that's the idea. It's because it's beyond what we can imagine. And I think anytime we're looking at the text of Heaven, we're looking at the text of the celestial city. We're thinking about the things that God has planned for us. We ought to have that in mind. It, it's not just because it, there's these veiled references and we can't understand. It's because it's too good. It's too good for us to fully comprehend this side of eternity. Let's read our text. We're, we're going to begin here with verses 1 through 9 of chapter 21. And then we'll, uh, as time allows, we'll get into chapter 22. John writes as he continues the revelation, he says, uh, verse 9, Then one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls full of the seven last plagues came and spoke with me, saying, Come here, I'll show you the bride, the wife of the Lamb. And he carried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain, and he showed me the holy city, Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, having the glory of God. Her brilliance was like a very costly stone, a stone of crystal clear jasper. It had a great and high wall with 12 gates, and at the gates were 12 angels. And names were written on them, which are the names of the 12 tribes of the sons of Israel. There were three gates on the east, three gates on the north, three gates on the south, and three gates on the west. And the wall of the city had 12 foundation stones, and on them were the 12 names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. The one who spoke with me had a gold measuring rod to measure the city and its gates and its wall. The city is laid out as a square with its length as great as its width. And he measured the city with the rod, 1,500 miles its length and width and height are equal. And he measured its wall, 72 yards, according to human measurements, which are also angelic measurements. The material of the wall was jasper, and the city was pure gold like clear glass. The foundation stones of the city were adorned with every kind of precious stone. The first foundation stone was jasper, the second sapphire, the third chalcedony, the fourth emerald, the fifth sardonyx, the sixth sardius, the seventh crystallite, the eighth beryl, the ninth topaz, the tenth chrysophase, the eleventh jacinth, the twelfth amethyst. The twelve gates were twelve pearls. Each one of the gates was a single pearl. And the street of the city was pure gold like transparent glass. 
I saw no temple in it. For the Lord God, the Almighty, and the Lamb are its temple. And the city has no need of the sun or of the moon to shine on it, for the glory of God has illumined it, and its lamp is the Lamb. The nations will walk by its light, and the kings of the earth will bring their glory into it. In the daytime, for there will be no night there, its gates will never be closed. And they will bring the glory and the honor of the nations into it. And nothing unclean and no one who practices abomination and lying shall ever come into it. But only those whose names are written in the Lamb's book of life. It's too awesome. It's too awesome to fully comprehend. John has already introduced us. We saw this last week. He's introduced us to the idea of a new heaven and a new earth. The old are gone. Now he begins to describe, he begins to see it in the vision. He begins to see it and describe the holy city in detail. He calls it the bride, which is really curious. The city itself is not the bride. In the same sense that an uninhabited house is not a home. The whole point of the glorious city is that it's inhabited by the bride. It's filled with the bride. It is our heavenly home. In the same way, the church, the church building is not the church, right? You guys get that. We, we refer to it as the church but you're the church. We're the church. The church is people. And so the city, it's referred to here as the bride, but it's only because the city is all about the residents. He's going to give us all the details of the structure, but it's really about us and the Lord being together. John is taken away, it says. In his vision, he's taken to a high mountain. I don't know if this is a literal high mountain. I think the whole idea is he's, he's given a vantage point. Again, but he doesn't really know how to describe it other than to say, I'm, far, I'm seeing this from above. I'm getting a panoramic vision of this whole thing. Able to see it all and able, even able to see and discern that it comes down from heaven. The detailed descriptions are fantastic. They're equally difficult to fathom, to completely understand. Now, there's a lot of details here. I think it's easy, it would be easy to get lost in the details, especially when you get into all those different gemstones. Like, good luck with that. I, I, I don't think it's necessary to completely understand all of the details. Rather, I think we should just grasp what's plain, plain and what's simple, what's easy to understand. And here's the thing that I think is overwhelming and that's really easy to understand. It's glorious. I mean, the word doesn't even, doesn't even fully fit. It's, it's glorious. It says, look at verse 11, having the glory of God. We don't know what that's like yet. Right? We don't fully understand it, but it summarizes everything. The, 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 the celestial city has the glory of God. God's present there. Again, I think that idea summarizes it all. And we cannot completely understand that this side of eternity. We can't fathom the glory of God. We know that Moses got a taste of it. He got a taste of it when the mountain was shaking he, he was able to, to come close. Peter, James, and John had, had a, a little glimpse of it on the Mount of Transfiguration where he, they saw Jesus glorified. When people experience the glory of God, it causes them to tremble, it causes them to bow down. This is our future. This, what he's describing, it's the future of the redeemed. It's the future for the Christian, for the believer, for all ages. This is ours. It's our inheritance. 
And, 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 and if you were just to summarize it all, it's we'll be with God. We're going to see God. Like, I don't know what's on your bucket list. Like, seriously, people have all kinds of things they want to do. Hey, how about this? I, I want to see God. And this is going to be fulfilled. We will see God. We will see the glory of God. J. Vernon McGee, in his commentary, now I'm not going to do an impersonation of him, but uh, that would be fun. The contemplation of her coming glory is a spiritual tonic for those who grow weary on the pilgrim journey down here. Again, I I think we should be mindful of heaven. We should be thinking about heaven. We should be aware of what the scripture says. And also just recognize this is the hope. This is the end of our lives. We will one day close our eyes here and open them there. The presence of God, it's it's fantastic. Now, John, throughout this thing, and we've seen it throughout the book of Revelation, he's, 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 he's using pictures of things that he knows to describe things that he can't understand completely. Clearly, some of it's understandable, but other things are not. But he says this. He says, he he uses the phrase, the brilliance was like. When he says like, you know he's doing his best. I don't have a point of reference other than this is kind of like this. He's doing his best to describe what he sees, but possibly without any reference other than just what he knows. And what he knows is exactly what the initial readers, the first century readers would have thought as well. That is, oh, okay, we get what you're talking about there, John. You're describing something that we know. Now, again, I think it's a mistake to get caught up too much in some of these details where he says, like a stone of crystal clear jasper. You can try to figure that out. Jasper comes in many different colors. Jasper, as we know it, it comes in many different colors, and it's opaque. So what does he mean when he says crystal clear jasper? We don't really know. Other than he's saying it's fantastic. Like, that's what he's saying. He's saying it's glorious, it's beautiful, it's precious. So again, you can work through that and try to figure out, if you're a geologist, maybe you can figure that out and and people have written about, oh, this is what it looks like. Good luck. Just know this, it's brilliant, it's beautiful, it's precious. And that's his point. Now, he describes the city with walls, with with a great wall and gates and guards. There's a great wall around the city, verse 17 tells us. And that it measures 72 yards. 72 yards, or 216 feet. Now, here's what it doesn't say. It doesn't say if that has to do with the width or the thickness or the height. And you can do your research on this. You can read with the commentary. You can read one commentary where the guy says, well, obviously it's 216 feet high. And you look at another guy, he says, obviously, it's 216 feet thick. And to that, I would just say yes. <laughs> Maybe one or the other or both, we don't really know. The point is, again, it's a massive wall. I mean, that's the point. This city is, is surrounded by a massive wall. Can you imagine a wall that's 216 feet thick? Like you could put a freeway on it. <laughs> So there's a, there's a wall. Now walls, we understand the purpose of walls. They're primarily for defense. They're, they're for defense of the city. They keep things out. It's also an establishment of a border. This wall is not necessary for security. Right? Jesus is on the throne. There, there, is, there is no reason for the wall, necessarily for security. No evil will be present any longer. I think it's symbolic. 
And I think the whole idea of it is that it's making a statement. And the statement is this, nothing evil is getting into the city. Again, this is something that the first century, they would, they would look at this and just go, this wall is like no other wall we've ever seen. This, this security measure is like no security measure we've ever seen. And I think that's, just, that's the point of it. There's 12 gates. And those gates are guarded by 12 angels. Look at verse 12 and 13 again. It had a great high wall with 12 gates and the gates, 12 angels. He goes on and says, there, you know, there's three gates on the east, three on the north, three on the south, three on the west. Why do we need angels stationed at the gates? Again, it's like, what, what's that all about? In Ezekiel's vision, God gave Ezekiel, the prophet Ezekiel, a vision of this same city in which he goes into great detail with it. And in Ezekiel chapter 40, verse 33, you can study this at home. We're not going to go there. Again, there's just so much detail here. He describes at each gate, there's a guard room. Evidently, that's where these angels are stationed. They're stationed in guard rooms at the gates. Again, why? I think the answer is exactly the same purpose as the wall. God's making a statement. And the statement is this. No evil is getting in. This is completely secure. And anyone, uh, any first century reader would read that and just go, wow. There is serious, there is serious security measures here. God's going to protect his people. It says in verse 27, Look at verse 27. Nothing unclean and no one who practices abomination and lying shall ever come into it, but only those whose names are written in the Lamb's book of life. That's a pretty clear statement. Again, I don't think we should, we, we should surmise that there is evil present in the world that could get in. But God's just making a statement. And his statement is, this is glorious, and it's also completely secure. Ever, nothing ever is going to get into the city. So beautiful. Now the gates, again, why 12 gates? Gates are for entry, right? Gates are, are they're in a way in, but also a way out. But the whole idea is, is with the 12 gates, we understand that with this city, there is also access. Access to come in, access to go out. And we're told that the gates never close. They're always open. There's nothing to protect from. But what's being indicated is there's going to be a flow of traffic. Right? People are going to come. People are going to go. Gates are for entry and exit. And it says in, well, in I think it's verse 24, the kings of the earth will bring their glory into it. In the daytime, there will be no night. Its gates will never be closed. They will bring the glory and the honor of the nations into it. So from these verses, open gates all the time, and then you have this idea that, 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 that people are literally going to be coming in and going out. Evidently, there's going to be traveling going on, which I don't know about you, but I kind of like. We're not, we're not confined to the city. There's going to be people coming in and people going out, but it's only going to be the redeemed. I, I think the idea is that we possibly, I think it's easy to extrapolate, we'll be able to travel to the rest of the globe, the rest of the planet, the new, the new earth. I don't know. I don't know what... I don't know what that's going to look like. I don't know what there will be to explore, but it's interesting. This is a secure city. The wall, the gates, the angels. They, they, that's the purpose. Is, is We should understand it's a secure city. And I think, again, in the mind of, of the early readers, it's a perfect city. All of these elements 
are things that they would say, this is very necessary for any city. We've got to have this. And it makes for a perfect city in, in the, the ancient mind. We might be thinking like, well, what about, what about highways? And, you know, it's like we, we have all kinds of other things that we think about in our modern context. But all of this is just saying one thing. This is perfect. It's glorious. It's beautiful. It's perfect. It's a perfect habitation for the people of God with God. And notice this, I think it's made really clear that the church and Israel are together. We're together with the nation. Now, many believe, many believe that the church has replaced Israel and that the promises that God made to Israel are now transferred to the church. This is called supersessionism or replacement theology or Fulfillment theology? I don't believe that. And I think these scriptures make it really clear. God, the, the, the patriarchs are referred to, the tribes are referred to over and over again. Their names are going to be written on the gates. Israel is referred to over and over throughout the book of Revelation. I don't know where people get the idea that somehow we replace Israel. No, we're going to be with redeemed Israel. The name of the 12 tribes are written on the gates. The name of the 12 apostles are written on the foundations. The church and Israel will be together. And yet, somehow, also remaining distinct. We are not Israel. We're the bride. Now, the size of the city is given to us. This is interesting. If you're a math person, this is fun. The measurements of the city are given. I'm reading from the New American Standard Bible, and the New American Standard Bible just calls it uh, 1,500 square miles, right? 1,500 miles this way, 1,500 miles that way, 1,500 miles high. King James uses furlongs, which I don't know what a furlong is. You guys use that in your everyday language, maybe if you're a horse person, horse racing. 12,000 furlongs. Uh, ESV is translating it uh, 12,000 stadia. Long measurements like this in the ancient world were not an exact science. Like They didn't have steel tape measures or lasers or anything like that. A stadia was a distance of between 607 and 630 feet. Distance over the ground at this time was measured by using long poles or rods laid successively end to end. It's kind of like how guys pace off a property. I actually saw someone doing it yesterday, pacing off the distance for the cornhole thing. It's like you, you can do that, but you get the idea. When you, when you pace off something, it's kind of, sort of. Right? It, it just gives you a rough idea, rough estimate. The, the stadion, which is the actual word here, is it is it sound it is exactly what it sounds like it is a reference to a stadium like it has it has to do with the ancient athletic venue which of course would have a, a track in it and so they would uh, have to build tracks in different cities in the culture of the day that they would have to be similar right because of athletic competition they would need to be Similar, the Greek running track was about 600 feet in length. And so they, there was a, that's a stadia. It became the name of the stadium. But when you look at these measurements, I think it's important for us to understand there's no, you know, again, I'm reading New American Standard. If you're reading something else, you might be going, how come, how come you said 1,500 miles and mine says 12,000 furlongs? It's not that there's any inconsistency. It's just that it's kind of close is the idea because there's inconsistency in how things were measured. And it wasn't as accurate as what we 
have today. So the idea is that the city, the measurements of the city, if we want to get, you know, as accurate as we can, we need to understand it's about 1,360 to 1,500 miles square. The point is, again, it's massive. It's massive. Now, some think it's a cube. Again, again, good luck. Good luck trying to picture this. I know, I know at different times it's been, you know, the different sci-fi movies have tried to portray this kind of a thing. But we don't really know what it would be like to live in a city that's a cube. It's kind of strange to think about. Others speculate, because it doesn't say that it's a square or that it's a cube, that maybe it's a pyramid. It could be 1,500 miles, you know, length and width and 1,500 miles high, but it's, but it's a pyramid. We know who's at the top, but, but we don't really know. Again, the, the, the point is it's, it's massive. Now, I, I'm not a math guy. You, if you're a math person, you could sit down and try to figure this out. I did read this, and I thought it was interesting. If the city was a cube, if the city was a cube, it could contain... Don't check my math on this. I just read this. It could be reliable. It could contain 1,500 trillion 28,000 square foot apartments. That's pretty decent. <laughs> the point is, it's a massive city that has enough space for all believers who have ever lived. And more. Right? And more. There hasn't been that many people living in the history of the world. So again, what are we talking about? We're talking about this glorious, beautiful city. It's, it's massive. It, it's going to rest. He, it's going to come down. It's going to be here on the new, well, not here, but it's going to be, it's going to reside on the new earth. It's going to have all of these different elements. It's going to be beautiful. The foundation stones, of which uh, there are 12. They're, again, they're described as precious gemstones. The gates are solid pearl. Like, that's at least something that we can kind of understand. I mean, those are big oysters. <laughs> but but, but it's, they're going to be solid pearl. Now, John, as he describes it, he says it's like pure gold, like clear glass. Now, good luck with that one. It's like, well, gold is not like glass. The word that's translated clear can mean clear, as we understand it, as in see-through, but it can also mean pure. In fact, the word is the same. Pure gold and, and clean glass or clear glass, it's the same word. So I think that's what he's talking about. Because even his reference, even his point of reference in regard to glass, they didn't have clear glass. If you've ever seen Roman glass, it's translucent, but it's not clear like our glass. It's not window glass like ours. It just let the light in, but, but it, it wasn't, you know, crystal clear like ours. So uh, again, it's like, who knows? Um, he's just saying it's pure gold, like clear glass. Like it's, I, I think the idea is that it's solid and that it's beautiful. Again, that's the overwhelming idea. Everything is beautiful. Everything is precious. The city streets are similarly described. Now the word there is transparent, but it could also mean translucent. Thankfully, it's not asphalt. <laughs> right? It's like, man, man, there's all these different, all summer long, there are these different paving projects. We're thankful, I'm thankful for the paving projects. There's nothing like driving on nice, fresh asphalt. But man, what an inconvenience to have to redo it all the time. There's no potholes. There's no potholes on the streets. They're pure. God is there. I mean, that's the over, overwhelming idea that we're given over and over again is God is there. God is present. He says there's no temple. 
because there's no longer a need for one. We're gathered together permanently with God. Verse 22 tells us that that God the Father and Jesus are going to be there. We're going to see God the Father. The Bible tells us no man has seen God the Father. We will. We will behold him. We will behold our Savior as well. And of course, the Spirit of God will continue to dwell within us. That which he has initiated in us as believers, that's going to be completely fulfilled. But the Holy Spirit's not going to depart from us. Our triune God is there. It says God is the light. Again, now, now this, this becomes like, what? How, what is this going to look like? I, I don't know. No one really understands this. How, how what concept, what can we, we, you know, even remotely kind of, you know, link this to the idea that there's no sun and yet there's light. Like in our world, everything comes from the sun. All the light comes from the sun. Even the moon, it's just reflected light. But this says there's not going to be any sun or moon. There's not going to be any, any need for them. God is going to illumine the place. Again, I don't know what that's going to be like. Sounds cool. We know the scripture describes God as being light. In 1 John 1, 5, it says, This is the message that we have heard from him and announced to you that God is light, and in him there's no darkness at all. There's no shadow, there's no darkness, there's no stain. He's light, he's perfect light. The Bible also indicates that God is surrounded by light. 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 16 says, who alone possesses immortality and dwells in unapproachable light whom no man has seen or can see to him be honor and glory and eternal dominion. Amen. God God dwells in unapproachable light. In regard to our mortal lives, we can't even approach him in the sense that he's light. And yet in the celestial city, we will all benefit from his light. We will, we will not only see him, but he's going to illuminate everything, it says. And I, I think that's pretty literal. I, I don't see it with, the, with the, the details that there's no sun. It's like, well, okay, how else are we going to have light? God himself is going to be the light. Somehow he's going to illuminate the world. Okay. Now, I think it's also, it's true, okay? So, so it's true, but I think it's also highly symbolic because it's a spiritual reality because light is, is wisdom, right? We understand that wisdom is referred to as light. The knowledge of God is going to permeate the world, emanating from him and filling this city. It's going to be glorious. Now, there's reference to the nations. This, I don't know what this means exactly, but it seems to indicate that the the earth is going to be populated beyond the the nation. That people are going to be spread out throughout the planet. Again, a, 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 a new planet, redeemed people. And the people are going to kind of come and go. They're obviously believers because sin and death is gone. Sin and death has been done away with. And the idea that the gates are open indicates that people will come and go. I think think there are some things, again, that I I don't understand all this because clearly the city is going to be enough for everyone to live in, and yet people are also going to live other places, seemingly, coming and going. John Walvert in his commentary said, Though the description of the city does not answer all questions concerning the eternal state, the revelation given to John describes a beautiful and glorious future for all who put their trust in the living God. Amen to that. Paul, in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 9, 
says this. He's quoting from a couple of texts in the, from the prophet Isaiah. He says, just as, as it is written, things which the eye has not seen and the ear has not heard and which have not entered the heart of man, all that God has prepared for those who love him. Again, he's saying exactly what I said initially. In many ways, this is all just too much. It's too hard to even fully imagine other than to say it's glorious, it's incredible. Who wants to go? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay, let's read on. Uh, and we're going to look at now in chapter 22, he begins to describe some of the internal features of the city. It says, then he showed me a river of the water of life, clear as crystal coming from the throne of God and of the Lamb. In the middle of its street, on either side of the river, was the tree of life, bearing 12 kinds of fruit, yielding its fruit every month, and the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. Verse 3, there will no longer be any curse, and the throne of God and of the Lamb will be in it, and his bondservants will serve him. They will see his face and his name will be on their foreheads. And there will no longer be any night, and they will not have need of the light of a lamp, nor of the light of the sun, because the Lord God will illumine them, and they will reign forever and ever. And he said to me, these words are faithful and true. And the Lord, the God of the spirits of the prophets, sent his angel to show his bondservants the things which must soon take place. And behold, I'm coming quickly. Blessed is he who heeds the words of the prophecy of this book. I, John, am the one who heard and saw these things. And when I heard and saw, I fell down to worship at the feet of the angel who showed me these things. But he said to me, do not do that. I'm a fellow bondservant of yours and of your brethren, the prophets, and of those who heed the words of this book, worship God. So after giving us the the description, the kind of the external things, the description of the city with the dimensions and the details. Now he begins to describe, again, some of these internal features of the city. He says there's a river. There's a river from the throne. From the throne of God flows a, a river of crystal clear water. Now, this is literal. I, I don't think there's any reason to look at this and go, oh, that's symbolic of something. It's literal. But then we have to understand that water is also highly symbolic throughout the scriptures. Water is a necessary element for life, right? You need water. This water comes from God. Like, like I don't know, you might, I, I don't know, my wife likes Perrier, uh, you know, you, you, maybe you've got a favorite mineral water or something that you drink. I drink it right out of the tap. But this is water that flows from the throne of God. Like, I want to drink it. I remember being in En Gedi in Israel, not this last time I didn't go, but when you hike up these canyons where it said this is where David had hid out when he was hiding from Saul, and there's these springs and waterfalls, and it's so, it's so glorious. And I just, I just like, I want to drink that water. I didn't because there's lots of animals and stuff around, you know. I didn't want to get Jardia in Israel, but it's like I just want to drink that. Just symbolically, it's super cool. Or Gideon's spring. It's like, I, yeah, we pretended to lap it up, but I, no. But this water comes from the throne of God. It's glorious. Water is necessary. It's a necessary element of life. It's, it's, it's similar, it seems like in the description here, it's similar to what is written about Eden. There was a river in Eden. Look at Genesis chapter 2, verse 10. A river flowed out of Eden to water the garden. And from there it divided and became four rivers. But in the beginning, in the garden that God created, that he gave to mankind, 
There was a river in that garden. I imagine that this river now that we're seeing that flows from the throne of God that evidently flows through the city, we're going to drink it. I mean, I, I think that's what it's for. And that in some regards, it's going to sustain life. In our glorified bodies, we're not going to be gods. The Mormons teach that we'll become gods. We don't believe that. We're going to be like God in the sense that we'll live forever, but we're not going to be gods. And in some sense, there may be things that we need like water to sustain our bodies, just as Adam did. Everything that we need will be provided by God. Th this water, it's going to be the purest, cleanest. It's going to be cold too, by the way. I'm sure of it. Right? It's going to be just beautiful. It's going to be wonderful. And we have access to it freely coming from God. He's going to supply every need that we have. And I think that's the symbolism of it. Everything that we need for life. And we could talk about how much trouble mankind has gotten into because we're going to the wrong well. Symbolically, right? It's the fruit. It's the, it's the wrong well. Whatever it is, we go someplace else other than what God wants to provide. Here, for eternity, He's going to provide everything that we need. So not only is there going to be this river, but then there's also going to be the tree of life. You know what? Ever since Eden... We've been looking for the tree of life. We've been looking for something that will sustain our mortal bodies. Who wants to live forever? Part of the fall was that mankind was banned from this tree. Genesis 3.22 says, The Lord God said, Behold, the man has become like one of us, knowing good and evil, now he might stretch out his hand and take also from the tree of life and eat and live forever. Evidently, it would seem this tree of life could sustain even fallen humans indefinitely. Like, that's just kind of weird. And so it says in verse 24, he drove man out. At the east of the Garden of Eden, he stationed cherubim and a flaming sword, which turned in every direction to guard the way to the tree of life. Evidently, in, in mankind's fallen state, if they ate from this tree of life, their bodies would be sustained indefinitely. And God says, no, that's not the plan. It's a sad reality that we would like to find this. We would like to find the tree of life. Longevity is a multi-trillion dollar industry. It's like the mythical fountain of youth. And we're looking for an herb or a pill that will allow us to keep living at all costs. Just keep living. The current, the current cure-all is, of course, CBD. You guys know that. <laughs> marijuana is, is the tree of life. The derivatives of the marijuana plant can cure everything. Anxiety, pain, prickly heat, whatever you got, right? They, and I'm just, I, I'm joking, but, but the idea is we're looking for something. Just give us something that'll cure whatever it is we got. Unfortunately, our craven desire for longevity, longevity it knows no moral or ethical bounds. Humanity has even resorted to using aborted babies. The, the tissue of aborted babies to try and, you know, keep our skin looking fresh. You can read about this. It's too horrific to even describe. Makes me want to throw up. And our country is, is, of course, we're doing all, all the kinds of things that we can with cosmetics and different things and, you know, all the different serums and all that. But other countries are way, way, way more advanced in, 
in this kind of horrific stuff. If we could find the tree of life, we would eat it, right? We would ingest it, and we would live forever. And we would miss what God intends for us, what he has provided. And it's not the extension of this fallen life. It is not. It's eternal life without sin's curse. That's what he wants for us. Now, I'm not saying we shouldn't take care of ourselves. We should. Take care of yourselves. But get wrinkled and old. <laughs> Do it together. And don't be thinking you're going you're gonna to outlive your, lot, your body. It, just die gracefully. Age gracefully. Seriously. I mean, I see people, it's like, dude, you're, you're like old. Act like it. Quit trying to dress like a teenager or whatever, you know. It's just like we just do goofy things. Now, it's interesting as you just kind of think about the whole idea of, of the tree of life. It, it's interesting how we worship trees. Humanity worships trees. The pagan cultures have always worshipped trees. And we've seen it in our modern culture. I mean, certainly there are people who literally worship trees. You've probably seen video clips of it. I don't know if any of you have come out of that kind of thing. It's strange. But in, in popular media, there is a lot of this that goes on. If you ever, you guys watch The Lion King? The tree, there's a tree of life. And it's presented as, as a place of wisdom and a place that sustains life. Disney even, in the Disney parks, they have something that they call the tree of life. It's not God's tree of life. The same thing if you've watched the, the, the Avatar movies. There's a tree of life. There, there's a tree that provides healing. There's a, a tree that provides spiritual wisdom. It's strange. And the ancient pagan cultures... You could read about this all through the Old Testament. The Canaanite cultures had what they called the Asherah pole. It was a, it was, it was a wooden pole. And, and this is a place they gathered and they worshipped. We're not exactly sure what all these things were, but I, I've seen some of the images that they called the Asherah. Usually they were, you know, it's carved pornography. And there was all kinds of weird things that went on with the, 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 the worship there in the Canaanite culture. And I love especially how uh, the prophet Isaiah mocked this. If you're familiar with his tone in Isaiah 44, he's just describing the, 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 the stupidity, really, uh, of men who worship trees or, or wooden objects. And so he, he's mocking here. That's his tone in Isaiah 44. He says, surely he cuts cedars for himself. And he takes a cypress or an oak and raises it for himself among the trees of the forest. He plants a fir and the rain makes it grow. Then it becomes something for a man to burn. So he takes one of them and warms himself. He also makes a fire to bake bread. He also makes a god and worships it. He makes it into a graven image and falls down before it. Half of it he burns in the fire. Over this half he eats meat and he roasts a roast and is satisfied. He also warms himself and says, Aha, I've seen the fire. But the rest of it he makes into a god, his graven image. He falls down before it and worships. He also prays to it and says, Deliver me for you are my god. He's, he's mocking. I love it. He's sarcastic. Oh, man, the prophet after my own heart. <laughs> He's just saying, this is what man does, though. We're, we're looking for something to worship. We're looking for something to deliver us. And it's just interesting that we have resorted to a tree, a piece of wood. God has something better. God provides a tree that actually does provide healing. John uh, describes this in detail. He talks about the, the fruit of the tree. Now, there may be more than one tree of life. I, I, 
I, it's referred to in the singular, but I think there may be more than one, but, but it exists. Here, here's the description of it. It bears 12 kinds of fruit every month. It's not like our fruit trees, right, where you get one thing seasonally. No, this is just happening all the time. And 12 different kinds of fruit. I like that. There's some variety in heaven. It's not, right, it's not just one thing. It's, it's several things. The leaves, it says, provide healing for the nations. Now, this is, this is perhaps the most curious phrase in all of this text. What does that mean? What do they need to be healed from, right? We have questions. We could speculate. I don't know if that's really going to be helpful. However, when you look at the word healing, it doesn't mean necessarily healing from a disease. It can also be translated therapy. It's literally the word that we use for therapy. I don't know. It could be that this is somehow pleasant or therapeutic to us, something that we just enjoy. We're told in 21.4 that there's no longer any curse, there's no longer any death. That's become really apparent. And that life is going to be sustained through this water and through the tree of life. So I don't know, it's something that evidently we need to eat that kind of keeps us going. Again, not, not healing from death, not healing from some sickness, but there's something that, that we're going to have to just kind of keep munching on. I don't know. The point is, God's going to provide it. Everything that we need, God's providing. This is what he does. Now, there's going to be service. People wonder, what are we going to do? Right? That's one of the things we wonder about. In fact, that's some of the things that people speculate about. Oh, heaven's going to be boring. What, we're going to worship God? Well, you've never worshiped God, so you don't know. You don't know what it's going to be like when you see him. But we're told that, that we're going to engage in service. I'm really not worried about this. <laughs> I've never been worried about what we're going to do in heaven. Right? I like my life here. You probably generally like your life here. In, even with all the pains and troubles that we have here, it's pretty good. It's going to be better. Right? That, that's what we need to know. And whatever we're going to be occupied with, it's going to be better. We're going to serve him. We're told we're going to, cons- we're going to be involved in serving God. Our concern ought not to be what we're going to do. It ought to be just to make sure we're going to be there and that we're taking as many people as we can. But again, verse 3 tells us we will serve God. There will be activity for us. And the difference is the service will be joyful. It'll be joyful. It'll be fruitful. I made a reference last week and it said, you know, that, that work was part of the curse. That needed really some explanation. Somebody wrote to me this week and said, what, that, what do you mean by that? Because I enjoy working. Of course. I think what I was referring to was the idea that oftentimes the work that we are engaged in is fruitless. Right? It's like doing the laundry or doing dishes. As soon as you get done, there's more. It's endless and seemingly fruitless. Or maybe, maybe you've got a crummy job, or maybe you're a farmer and you get weeds and rocks. And, you know, and the whole point is, is that part of the curse is the thorns and thistles. But this is going to be service that's joyful. We're going to be occupied serving God, and we're going to see him face to face, and, and it's going to be awesome. And he will be among us. We'll be with him. He's going to illumine everything. And don't miss this if you, if you didn't catch it, verse 5, forever and ever. Forever and ever. We sing that great line in Newton's Amazing Grace. And I don't know about you, but every time I get there, I tear up. When we've been there, when we've been there 10,000 years, bright shining is the sun, We've no less days to sing God's praise than when we first begun. Such a great line. And it's the truth. It's the reality. Forever and ever. The angel says, 
right, these words are faithful and true. We saw this phrase earlier. It's like the same thing. Why do you need to say this? It's the word of God. Of course it's faithful and true. Just know this. Mark this. These words are faithful and true. We may not understand all the details of the prophecy, but it should not be ignored. It should not be discounted. I don't know. I don't know what's up with the Christian groups that don't really pay any attention to Revelation or say, oh, it's all just, you know, it's too much to understand. Are you kidding me? I've so enjoyed this journey once again to go through this prophetic book. Next week, we're going to finish it. It's such, I love being reminded of the, these things that are yet to come and, and especially of heaven. This is the future and it's the hope of the believer. Jesus interjects here in the midst of this. A lot of this is just an interchange between John and these different angels. But Jesus himself interjects here in verse 7 and says, Behold, I'm coming quickly. Again, we need to hang on to that. We need to hang on to that in the midst of whatever we're going through. We need to recognize that he is coming quickly. And whether that means he's coming for you in the rapture or you're going to him, the idea is it's not going to be too long. We should live that way. We should keep that in mind. It's not going to be too long. None of us are going to live that long. Relative to eternity, right? He says, I'm coming quickly. Blessed is he who heeds the words of the prophecy of this book. Now, there's not so much in here to obey, right? There's, there's not things like, oh, here's a list of things you ought to do because this is true. But just to know and to understand that this is actually going to happen. Everything that's been described in, in this book, so much as we can discern and understand it, it's going to happen. And that ought to compel a certain way to live, right? With our, with our eyes towards heaven, with our minds on these things. And it should change the way we live. And again, as I said earlier, we ought to make sure that we're going, but also that we're bringing as many people with us as we possibly can. Bring your friends, bring your kids, bring your loved ones, bring your mom and dad, bring as many people as you can to heaven. Amen? John's overwhelmed. He's, I think he's recounting what we read earlier, but he's just saying, hey, when I saw all this, I fell down. I fell down and worshiped the one who was describing it to me. It was too much. And the angel says, no, no, no. Don't worship me. We don't worship angels. And so the angel says, worship God. Worship God. And that's what we do. And we continue to do. And that's what we're going to do right now. As we just end this time, we're looking forward to communion. We're going to have communion together. And I think it's interesting that just as there was a tree of life in the garden and there will be a tree of life in heaven, God has provided by a tree that we would get there. Right? There's another tree. And it's the tree that we recognize over and over and over again. It's the tree of the cross. The piece of wood on which our Savior died to pay the penalty for sin as he took upon himself the curse and the punishment, the punishment that was due you and I. As guilty sinners, we come and, and we don't worship the piece of wood, but we worship the Savior who gave his life for us. And so as we sing these songs, as we partake in communion together, Let's do it mindful of what's coming, but also remembering what our Savior has done for each one of us. If you're not trusting in Jesus Christ, turn to him today. Again, God has provided. He's provided a way for us to enter into heaven. And that way is Jesus. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for all that we can read and understand about what's coming. Thank you for the picture of, of the celestial city, your provision 
for the believer, your provision for humanity, for the future. God, thank you for the hope that you've given us. Thank you, Lord, that, that we're going. We want to just reaffirm as we take communion this morning, we want to reaffirm our belief in Jesus, our trust in you. God, we admit before you that we're sinners. We don't deserve any of this. Your word makes it clear. We don't deserve this, and yet you've provided it for us, for all who will turn to you and put their hope in Jesus. And so we do that, and we affirm it today. As we drink the juice, we remember that your blood and your blood alone can atone for sin. We remember your body that was surrendered on the cross for us. We praise you this morning in Jesus' name. Amen.